Good morning. I am reading the scripture today from Luke 1, chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. And it's found in your pew Bible in the New Testament on page 56. During the time when Herod was king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife's name was Elizabeth. She also belonged to a priestly family. They both lived good lives in God's sight and obeyed fully all God's laws and commands. They had no children because Elizabeth could not have any. And she and Zechariah were both very old. One day, Zechariah was doing his work as a priest in the temple, taking his turn in the daily service. According to the custom followed by the priest, he was chosen by lot to burn incense on the altar. So he went into the temple of the Lord. While the crowd of people outside prayed during the hour when the incense was burning, An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar, where the incense was burned. When Zechariah saw him, he was alarmed and felt afraid. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You are to name him John. How glad and happy you will be, and how happy many others will be when he is born. He will be a great man in the Lord's sight. He must not drink any wine or strong drink. From his very birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go ahead of the Lord strong and mighty, like the prophet Isaiah. He will bring fathers and children together again. He will turn disobedient people back to the way of thinking of the righteous. He will get the Lord's people ready for him. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know if this is so? I am an old man and my wife is old also. I am Gabriel, the angel answered. I stand in the presence of God who sent me to speak to you and to tell you this good news. But you have not believed my message, which will come true at the right time. Because you have not believed, you will, not be, you will be unable to speak. You will remain silent until the day my promise to you comes true. In the meantime, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he was spending such a time in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. And so they knew that he had seen a vision in the temple. Unable to say a word, he made signs to them with his hands. When his period of service in the temple was over, Zechariah went back home. Sometime later, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and did not leave the house for five months. Now at last the Lord has helped me, she said. He has taken away my public disgrace. Today, we remember the hope of Zechariah and Elizabeth. We remember the hope for something new, for a child, for a future. We give thanks for hope realized that with God, nothing is impossible. That through God, miracles happen. So we wait 
and we hope as we near the birth of the Christ child. Some of you may remember my friend, Kara, who came and preached for us over the summer uh, when I was, I think, on vacation. Um, and one of the things that Kara and I share in common is a love of gardening. And I will tell you, Kara is much more organized at it than I am. She has a plan for her garden, and I throw seeds on the ground. Especially in winter gardening, I thought, I've never done this before, so let's just see what happens. I grabbed some seed packets from the store and literally just threw them on the ground. And then did not write down what I threw where. <laughs> so it's been a really um, kind of exciting time guessing, is that a weed or is it lettuce? Should I pull that up or let it keep going? And to some degree, I had to just let things keep going, because what if I pulled up the lettuce, and then we had no lettuce. So um, I've been able to see it. We have radishes growing, and I can see their little red tops, so I know things are happening. With the carrots, similar to the lettuce slash weeds, it's just the green stuff. I can't see if there's a carrot under the ground there. I constantly have to keep little hands from trying to dig around to see if anything's growing, because if you disturb it, then nothing is definitely going to grow. And so as Kara and I were talking about this, she uh, very lovingly put me in my place and said, well, what if you think about gardening as a spiritual discipline? And I said, well, that's annoying. What do you mean? <laughs> and she said, especially with winter veggies, you have to trust what's happening. There's some kind of magic happening under the dirt, but you can't see it. You have to leave it alone and let it work. Leave it alone and let it work. That's pretty annoying and not what we like to do, is it? We saw in our story with Zachariah, right, that he didn't necessarily just want to leave it alone. And he had questions for Gabriel. And so Gabriel took his voice and said, let's trust. Let's wait. I do want to point out that the scriptures today and often many of our scriptures through Advent can be hard for those of us who have had fertility struggles either currently or in the past. And I acknowledge that and know that and am praying with you if that is the case. And sometimes these scriptures are reduced to just a birth miracle, but we know there is so much more to the story than just that. There are so many layers here as we look at Zechariah and Aaron, who are both priestly descendants. They both come from the same line of a job that is not a job, but a birthright. You know, to some degree, I got to choose to do this. God asked me very strongly to consider it, but I got to choose. Aaron, or uh, Zechariah, does not get to choose. It is his by birthright. And so you, you can guess, there are lots of priests in the country as people have families and families. So everyone was grouped together and your group of priests got a week to serve twice a year. So that's where we are in the story. Zachariah's group is serving for a week. And then today, Zachariah has been chosen by lot to be the one who gets to go into the holiest part and offer prayers for the people. So once in a lifetime opportunity that he has been given to go into this sacred space that not everyone is allowed to be in. And it's generally understood, you hear it in the text, that there's a length of time this should take. I know that none of you have clocked how long the sermon is going on any given Sunday. The church I grew up in had a, had a clock at the back so that the pastor could be on time. <laughs> But I know that's not what anyone here does. But in the story, that's kind of what's happening. The congregation outside is starting to wonder, what is Zechariah doing in there? Why is it taking so long? What's God doing in there? And I'm sure they were grumbling and thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to be late for lunch. 
what if the pagans get to the food stand before we do? And so they're just grumbling, and they're not realizing that a miracle is happening. Something is moving at that time. Zechariah thought he was just going in to do his job. Elizabeth thought that everything was going to be normal that day. And I wonder about Zechariah getting to do this once-in-a-lifetime thing if he was excited or nervous to go in there alone, to be selected for that day. But also maybe it was just another day of work. You show up and you do it and you go home. I was pondering, I wonder what he prayed there. It says he's supposed to pray for the people. But did he slip in a little prayer for himself and for Elizabeth? Did he feel far from God at that moment because of the personal disappointment that he was feeling? Did he feel alone or lost or confused? Did he walk in with a million questions? Or did he just go through the motions? But he still showed up. No matter how he was feeling, he came to that temple prepared to talk to God. One of the commentaries I read called that faithful emptiness. Faithful emptiness. Showing up every day, going through the motions, acting faithful even when we are uncertain about what's going on. Many of us are familiar with Mother Teresa and the work that she did in India, caring for the sick and dying in Calcutta, but what some people don't know is how distant she felt from God through almost all of that work. Once she starts her missionary society, much of her correspondence changes to lament that she feels spiritually dry, that there's a darkness, a loneliness, that she cannot feel God anymore. But she showed up every day. She kept caring for the needy and the dying. Because God had told her to, she kept doing it. Faithful emptiness. We even hear from King David a psalm that is attributed to him where he says, I feel empty. Remember David, who was chosen by God to lead Israel. David, who we uplift as part of the beginning of Jesus' own line, writes in Psalm 13, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must my enemy triumph over me? Look at me, God. Give me a light in my eyes else my foes rejoice over me. And then in verse 5 it says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation, and I will sing your praises. David says, how long, O God, will I feel far from you? How long, O God, will I feel this emptiness from you? And yet I, David, stay faithful. We are in charge of staying faithful, of going through our ordinary, everyday things and motions that we can control, showing up on Sunday, helping our neighbors who need it. And then God is in charge of transforming those ordinary actions into something extraordinary. That's what God is in charge of. As we begin the holiday season, it's easy to get caught up in the stress, in the activities, in the baking, in the parties, in the perfect memories, that perfect Christmas card picture that we all strive for. But it can also be easy to get caught up in the loneliness, the emptiness around your table, the sadness at someone missing. And in those feelings, we trust that God is still present. We trust that God is still using us. And we remember Zachariah's faithfulness, faithful patience, faithful trust 
faithful emptiness. We remember and we trust that God does extraordinary things with our ordinary lives. We trust that God will use us. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we strive every day to trust you, to remember the example that we see in Zechariah and Elizabeth of showing up, going through the motions, reaching out to you, knowing that even if we can't feel you, you are there, remembering that we are your children and you change and transform us, you use us and guide us. Help us to rest in that hope, to trust in that hope. In your name we pray.